Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your post apocalyptic hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And this is the show where we review all the anime series from the previous season we did and didn't watch start to finish. So, since John graciously gave us two or rather three reviews last episode, it's his turn to sit back, relax, and only talk about one series today. And that series is Kino's Journey, uh, the new adaption of the popular light novel. And for me, it's time to step up my game, so I will kick off the show with a review of Juni Tyson's Zodiac War and finish up this episode by talking about Girl's Last Tour. So, kind of a mirror version of the previous episode, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I hope you'll enjoy, so stay tuned, we'll be right back. Battle Royale seem to have a bit of a revival right now. Most recently in the form of, for example, the Hunger Games novels and movies, TV series like The 100, and uh, in the video game sector with PlayerUnknown Battleground and <laughs> and the corresponding mode in Fortnite. I'd like to apologize, I have my opinions on PUBG, but move on. Yes. <laughs> Who doesn't? Anyway, uh, there are probably many more of those ill coming since that game was such a giant success, so there's probably uh, developers falling over themselves trying to build Battleground modes into their ga coming games, so, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, MOBA is old hat, now it's about that Battlegrounds, baby! Yeah, it's probably only going to be those two first games who will be able to sustain themselves on, you know, that idea alone. So, <laughs> yeah, have fun losing money, guys. Anyway, uh, we also had some anime and manga series playing in that particular ballpark uh, as well over the years. Of course, uh, of course there is the famous novel by uh, Kushin Takami with the actual name Battle Royale, uh, which was adapted uh, not only into two live action movies, which I've seen the first one of, uh, but also a manga series, which I haven't read. Um, there was Batum, a manga series that also got a 12 episode anime adaption. I think I've watched like, watched like one episode of that, decided it looked like crap and didn't continue. <laughs> So. Yeah, I saw the name thrown around, but I didn't actually know anything about it, so now I know. Yeah, well, it looked trashy, but, you know, <laughs> just judging from the first episode. And, of mm. course, um, you could also file series like uh, The Fate Franchise, Guns, Future Diary, or even Danganronpa, uh, which also got several anime adaptions at this point into that genre, at least to some extent. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Killing Bites. <laughs> Cannot oh, fail to oh, mention oh, this that show in every of our episodes. <laughs> but that also uh, is, <laughs> you know, it's running right now. And at, at least in the current an uh, arc in the anime is adhering to the Battle Royale formula or format. So, yeah. In its most strict definition, though, Battle Royale is probably characterized by, you know, giving us a cast of various characters that get thrown into a somewhat closed-off environment uh, that for one reason or another they can't easily escape from. Sometimes this is due to them being the playthings of a mad society, uh, this being the case in the original Battle Royale and uh, Danganronpa. Um, sometimes, like for example, in the Hunger Games, this aspect is combined with the protagonist hoping for a certain prize or goal uh, promised to them by the previously mentioned mad leaders of society, uh, be it a lot of money, better standing for their peers, or simply freedom. Uh, and sometimes it's just a magic, all-fulfilling wish MacGuffin like in the Fate franchise. Then they have to face off against each other, uh, either with weapons they can, you know, bring along, have to acquire, or are supplied with by an outside party, so you can Hunger Games or Battle Royale, or with their wits, uh, like in Danganronpa. So, the most captivating aspect of a Battle Royale themed story is following a well-defined sympathetic main protagonist or set of characters uh, while the story always keeps you guessing who's the next one to die because at least none of the side characters tend to be safe in those tales uh, would you would mm. you disagree john uh, <laughs> i mean you I mean, are you a know, fan of the danganronpa series like yeah coming off of danganronpa yes yes no one is safe ever on a surface level, Juni Tyson Zodiac War, the first tour on the docket today, which is an adaption of 
the light novel by the same name, written by Nisio Ishin, is the perfect distillation of the Battle Royale formula. Uh, Ishin, by the way, is probably most well known for being the creator of the Monogatari series, which I haven't seen a single entry uh, of. There are a lot of anime series for the Monogatari series. I haven't seen one, a single one of them. Uh, you, John? Uh, I have a few friends who have religiously been watching it from the beginning, and I, every time I sort of think about it, I'm like, there's a huge barrier to entry because there's so much, and I just end up pushing it further away. Maybe, maybe someday I'll think about it, but today's not that day. Yeah, it's Monogatari seems to have its fans, but this one, this seems like Isim wanted to try his sense at something different. So in Juni Tyson, we have 12 characters, all themed after the animals in the Chinese zodiac, facing off against each other. The battleground, so to speak, <laughs> is an empty, closed off city. Um, the 12 characters are warriors and fighters, all specialists in their respective fields. For example, we got Tiger, who is a martial arts prodigy, Ox, who is the best sword fighter in the world, Sheep is an expert on explosives, and so on. Um, everyone wears a costume themed after their respective animal, which makes them very distinctive and interesting looking, and also often reflects their kind of fighting style a bit. And there are some really neat designs in this show. For example, uh, Ox looks like a bit like a Spanish torero with ox horns on his head. Uh, there is Tiger, who wears a skimpy, well, Tiger bikini costume. Uh, what you would expect, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Red, who has like this sleek, high-tech battle suit. And then there is, of course, everyone's favorite rabbit, who is like this muscular dude in drag and heels. Uh, he has black and red eyes, is equipped with two giant hatchets, and is a necromancer. He's also scary as fuck. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it's a cast of uh, colorful characters. Check. As for motivation, mm, they are all taking part in this giant fight to the death that seems to occur on a regular basis. At least there seems to have been generations of fighters before this, and, and events like this before this. this is, uh, the Zodiac War, and there are even characters in there that have participated multiple times, apparently, or, you know, who, uh, you know, have won before, or, you know, are from families that have won in this in this con uh, contest before. So, yeah, this seems to, like, this, this contest, uh, this Zodiac War, seems to have a storied history in this world. Uh, a bit like Rollerball, maybe, or, <laughs> or Running Man, uh, although there is not really a big audience witnessing this. The characters... Participating is, uh, in this expect to stand as the final survivor and to get their biggest wish fulfilled, which doesn't seem to be restricted to wealth and power. At least it's not really specified. Although since this tournament seems to be sponsored by the most wealthy people in the world who can like bet on the different characters and are also the only spectators, this is probably what it comes down to in the end. So yeah, clear motivation that can be expanded upon for each individual character, also check. Now, like I said, on the surface, this all seems nice and good. 12 warriors fighting to the death against each other. Who comes out on top? Who do we root for? But this is where the problems of the show already begin. I found it very hard to let onto a character in this show. Two reasons for that. First, we only learn enough about a few select characters to empathize with them. Second, some of the cast members are so repulsive that it's hard to give a damn about them. <laughs> and weirdly enough, the show decides to spend two whole fucking episodes on two of the lamest, most uninteresting and repulsive characters in the show. And that in a series where we get a very, very limited time for character development for each character because there is 12 episodes and, you know, we got 12 characters, and that means we will lose at least one cast member in every episode. So wasting what little time you have on the uninspired background story for two of the worst members of the cast is a really poor choice. I have no idea who signed up on that, if that was already in the light novel or a weird directional choice, but it doesn't do the show any favors. Speaking about losing cast members, as mentioned before, there is pretty much one character death in every episode. Now, that can still be a fun formula if you can't see coming who is next, and if the characters are either developed well enough to make you care about their demise, or the fights and death scenes are exciting and dramatic enough to pull you into the action. Sadly, again, 
the show rarely manages to pull off either. The probably biggest flaw in the Zodiac setup is that the show adheres way, <laughs> way too close to its blueprint. Basically, if you know the order of the Chinese Zodiac for some reason, guess what? You already know in what order the characters will die. Because the show follows it precisely. Oops. <laughs> so, to get maybe even a sliver of surprise and enjoyment out of the show, if you don't know the order of the Zodiac, don't look it up before watching this. <laughs> At all. You, you know, any surprise will be completely ruined. But even if you don't, the character deaths are way too predictable most of the time. The characters who get gets his or her background story in the episode dies in that episode most of the time. The don't, the you love, don't you love death flags? Like yeah. plain as day death flags? Yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. The show rarely strays from that formula. You know, it's, there are some outliers here and there, but it's really, most of the time, that's what happens. You get a background story and a character, and you know, okay, that character is gone at the end of this episode, and that's what happens. Akamega Kill had the same problem for most of its runtime, which, you know, I enjoyed that show, but that was also a big problem for me, because it, you know, it ruined the surprise. Also, I, I would say, like, that show, it's less excus excusable for that show because it had long a longer runtime, so you could have gotten the character background stories out of the way earlier and then kill the characters off later when they're more well established. I, I'm willing to give Zodiac War a bit of leeway because it has only 12 episodes, but then again, I wonder if they shouldn't just have given it like double, you know, the runtime to establish some of the characters and background story earlier and then maybe kill him off in a not so predictable order here too so yeah uh, that was disappointing also at a certain point it's just very easy to deduce who will be the winner of this tournament by character traits and design alone i didn't know anything about the order of the zodiac and had the winner packed pretty much from the very beginning just because of the way their character was designed and behaved in the show and what they said and what they did and everything so yeah Mm. Uh, it's all it's all way too predictable and that's that is a big problem one of the main draws like i said of a battle royale is not really knowing who of the side characters bites the dust next and the reasons for it and the show does just not a good job at keeping you you know keeping you guessing now all of that still wouldn't be so bad if the characters were well developed I already talked about how it's hard to latch onto some of the characters, but there are a few sympathetic characters that you want to root for in the story nonetheless. The problem is, the moment you have learned enough about them to really care, they usually almost immediately are killed off. And here's the next problem. Not really in a spectacular or exciting way. Um, mm. A lot of the death scenes in the show are quick, dirty, out of nowhere, and unspectacular, which you know, okay, fits in a real-world context, I guess, because that's what death usually is like, but it doesn't make for an exciting viewing experience whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, you see a fight, you think, oh, there's going to be some build-up, there's be a wild clash, it's going to be a wild clash, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a character is killed, and you just, okay, I would be surprised, but, you know... <laughs> There's no build-up to that, and there's no gravitas to that. The character just dies, and then it's over. It's like that character doesn't really matter anymore. And it's just, yeah, it's... Ah, that All of that felt super flat. Super flat for me. Now, the fights in the show are actually pretty cool at times, albeit sometimes way too short. Um, but we got some neat fighting choreography, some cool camera work, sometimes even pretty great CG that works surprisingly well. And it's comparable to the stuff I mentioned before in uh, in Orange stuff and in, you know, the One Piece and Dragon Ball movies. The show is animated by Grafinica, who have done a lot of in-between and second key animation, but have also done the animation production on the CG anime movie Expelled from Paradise, written by mm. Gen Urobuchi, which I liked a lot, believe it or not. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one. I keep meaning to and I keep putting it off. Yeah, I, I, I'd recommend it. I mean, it's still, you know, it's CG anime with all the trappings that entails, but it's good. It's good CG anime. And it's written, you know, by one of the best writers in the biz, in my opinion. So there you go. 
Junior Tyson is directed by Naoto Hosoda, who is also the director for the previously mentioned Future Diary and also The Devil is a Part-Timer, uh, a th show we both enjoyed, I think, a mm. lot. Yeah. Um, and yeah, action direction-wise, this show looks pretty good most of the time. The animation quality is not very consistent, though, and it drops in some of the fights and is, is especially janky in certain quite a dialogue-driven scenes, which takes you know, again, away from some of the things the characters say and, you know, makes you... T it just pulls you out of the show at times. But most of the important fights look good. There are some interesting choreography stuff in there. Can't really complain that much there. Whether you will get anything out of the show depends on if you can pull enough enjoyment out of some cool fights, neat designs, and pretty good music by Goshina who worked on Dimension W, many of the Tales and God Eater games, and their respective anime series. Mm, I really, that's cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed the sh soundtrack of that show. There is this one especially great theme that m gets played when, you know, the, the fight ramps up and, you know, a, a dramatic encounter is about to happen. So that's cool. <laughs> I just wish the stuff happening on screen in cer at certain times would, you know, reflect the dramatic tone of the music more. Mm. Yeah, and the show tries to say some meaningful things about war and the human condition, but most of that stuff falls flat in my opinion, especially since the most interesting characters in the show just don't get enough screen time. I mean, I don't have to learn something substantial about every character. Um, Rabbit, for example, is, you know, he's just a demonic force of nature that is scarier exactly because you know so little about him but if you give me some interesting characterization for one of the characters please let me spend some time with them afterwards so that i can engage and you know more interested into what they have to say before killing them off and Junior tyson you know just didn't bother to do that yeah otherwise there is just no motivation to get emotionally invested in any of their stories and you know that's that's what happened most of the time in this show. It's just like, okay, we have a character that could be interesting, has a semi-interesting background, has some interesting things to say, and then we got some ideologies clashing against each other, and then one of the characters dies, and that's that. And we probably saw that death coming for, beforehand, so yeah, nothing is left. <laughs> and yeah, there's not really any interesting statement or, or substantial statement being made by the end of the show either. It all feels kind of like... I don't know. <laughs> it's not well thought out and, you know, just just a weird writing exercise. So yeah, Junior Tyson Zodiac War, pretty solid setup for a Battle Royale story, really bad execution with lots of wasted screen time and potential and really nothing that interesting to say. Uh, in my opinion, you can skip this one. So, like we were saying earlier, sank it up on the uh, docket today is Kino's Journey of the Beautiful World, which is the this past year's 2017, I guess you could call it reboot of Kino's Journey. Uh, have you watched the original show? No, I've heard good things about it, but I never went and checked it out. Probably yeah. because also the production values are supposed to be not that great for that show, and maybe that's what turned me from checking it out. I don't know. I mean, I had heard that it was a pretty good, you know, version of its story as well. This one is, hmm, it, it <laughs> this leaves me with a lot of questions and not good ones or about the plot or the characterization, you know, not questions that matter. They leave me with the questions about the production itself. Oh, boy. Uh, so what's the brief overview? Kino is this uh, girl who, in I want to, I should have said this back when we did the preview segment for this, because I didn't realize Kino was a girl. That's apparently <laughs> more heavily number one. It's more heavily uh, talked about in the original series, and it comes up as a point later on in this current series. So there yeah. we go. That's me fact checking myself in not real time. 
Kino is this girl who uh, loves traveling. Nothing fills her heart with joy like exploring, you know, the wondrous world around her and the fascinating ways people live. Uh, Kino, you know, travels around on this sentient motor rad, which, you know, is just a motorcycle. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's German for motorcycle. So Uh there you go. (laughs) I'm not as much of a linguist as I hoped. (laughs) (laughs) It's fine. Uh, This motorcycle's name is Hermes. And like I said, it's a sentient motorcycle that can speak with her. Uh, Sort of caught me off guard at first because it just not knowing anything about the original show going in. Oh, her bike can talk. Yeah, right. I mean, that could be cool, like the anime version of Knight Rider. I don't know. It doesn't ever really feel that way, though. What a shame. <laughs> Hermes gives uh, Kino emotional support on their journey and, you know, talks with her through their hardships and whatnot. Uh, and together they travel the vast countryside and they go from one nation to another. But Kino's rule is to never stay in one country for more than three days because she wants to see, you know, as much as she can. Mm. Okay. That's, that's, that's the conceit of the story is interesting. Um, as they, you know, encounter new people and learn the rules of the different, uh, countries that they go to, they find more and more about their own values and virtues. But let's, let's be real and talk about this for a minute. This show, I feel like, has a serious identity issue. Mm-hmm. And you you jumped out in two or three episodes? Two. Two. That's when I like I checked out two episodes, decided, well, maybe I'll get back to it later. And then I heard a lot of bad things about this adaption, like from people who enjoyed the first show, uh, he really harped on it. And I was like, ah, okay, maybe... Mm. <laughs> Maybe I should check out the old show after all, but yeah, it, did, it sounded not, not good. I feel like there are the makings of an interesting show in this, and apparently that is, you know, more than just a feeling because, you know, we keep saying what everyone has said about the previous series. Mm-hmm. So what happened here? Well, it just is kind of boring and uninteresting to be point blank about it. The idea of going, you know, and seeing these different civilizations, that's, again, like I said, that's a cool idea to start off from. But it doesn't really seem like Kino takes much away from her stay in each country. In this, you know, it seems like it's supposed to be, it's intended to be a story of self-growth and discovery of, you know, both yourself in the world around you and it feels like it consistently misses that mark and there's also some like i don't know if i call it pacing problems but sometimes you know you're expected to believe that you know she spends three days in each place fine sometimes they go way overboard in details on one place and then they just completely gloss over other things and i i know i can't think of the right word for it either but like i said it, the the self-discovery and journey you know parts of this show are only there like they're hanging on by a thread i feel like the director uh tomohisa taguchi m- wanted to make this like an action show or something because there's like these Ah. there's these like bursts of action it's like what where did this come from i don't so they feel really misplaced they feel incredibly misplaced i've seen i've seen like the really like probably one of the standouts in that regard is the scene with with i don't know where kino like shoots sheep or something and it's like this dramatic shot of fucking sheep exploding or i don't know (laughs) it's really ridiculous We'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. Because they, you know, try to play off, you know, the world is beautiful and yet it's not because there's always something like, oh, 
in this town, it's... Are, are you uh, saying it's a it's a beautiful yet ugly world? Yes. <laughs> For our next review. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the show is difficult to talk about, but it's difficult to really get a grasp of what they're trying to go for. Because in the first uh, town, kingdom, country, whatever, city, place, mm -hmm. you want to call it. They, All of those things. They don't really seem too consistent on the size and the, you know, construction of each area there. Because um, <laughs> in the first one, it's like, oh, killing is permitted, except, you know, if you do that, you're going to get, you know, fucked up, so, so don't do it. Like, okay, if you're permitted to kill, but you're not, and then there's like this one kingdom where, oh, we're having a, you enter here, but we're having a big battle royale, and it's like this ends up being this huge coup against the leader of the country and the son like goes away and starts on his own journey and they spend maybe like one episode on him and then conveniently forget about him after that because what's character development yeah it's, sounds a bit like a like a patchwork or something that doesn't really that's, fit well that's together a, that's a really great word thank you <laughs> Because I wouldn't have been able to pull that out of my own, own head. Yeah, Patrick v suits the construction of this show very well because it's just so unevenly paced. No one like, – even Kino herself, they, they go into her backstory like a little bit once. And beyond that, it's like there's not a lot of interesting character development. I felt – I was just going to say I felt really bored by this show. That's a shame. And why I watched it from beginning to end, I don't know. You had the right <laughs> idea getting out in the second episode. So not There's, even the misplaced action scenes are exciting. They're well animated. Okay. Um, that's pretty much the only part of the show that's really well animated. I was about to say, when I saw, watched the first episode, especially the scenes where Kino's writing uh, Hermes. Oh, um, God. Really janky. The that's, CG is really bad. The CG model they use for that, oh, oh my god! From a distance, fine. Up close, no. And the show like goes out of its way to avoid teaching these like meaningful life lessons. And it's like, were you hoping to teach your audience something with this show? Because y you didn't do it. Is it like? Is it, is it like maybe a case of okay, we got these. These semi-philosophical uh, ideas, you know, that that are brought up, and that you are supposed to make your own mind up about, uh, or you know, come to your own opinion about what is this society supposed to mean, or what is the. Hey, did is... you did you know killing is bad, being a despot is bad, war is bad, fucking. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I get. I'm, so, so it feels more like blunt force trauma than anything, or uh, nothing, nothing at all. Like either one of those. Yes. Okay, well, that's a shame. I mean, it, it just from the concept alone, it seems interesting to just put up a, a lot of different ideas of alternative societies, and even if it's got like this patchwork nature to it, and these different, many different pastiche of of like different you know, different uh, ideas and uh, different ideologies and different societies that don't quite exactly work like ours. If there's a strong underlying theme there that connects everything that, you know, even if th the other stuff seems fragmented, that could work. But it sounds like... But there's not. Yeah, th there's nothing that really holds it together and gives it an interesting through line. So let's let's go back. We talked about the director Tomohisa Taguchi, who's directed stuff like the second and fourth Persona Three movies, Persona Four Golden, and Twin Star Exorcists. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think we have our opinions about Twin Star Exorcists. But... Oh, yeah. I mean, I never <laughs> talked about the series. I wanted to finish it to the end, but even for me, Mister Shonen Action fanboy, that just was to fucking road and oh, ah, yeah. generic got... and bad and focusing on like the worst for me at least worst aspects of shonen where it's like hey do you like watching your characters being fucking teenagers and and yelling at each other for <laughs> most of the time and misunderstandings oh she thinks he's a perf and hits him in the face ah 
Kill yeah, me. I think, <laughs> I think I got two or three episodes in and I was like, I see exactly where this show is going. See you later. And I mean, it got it got better because there's a time jump in, in that show and the characters, you know, get more mature and, you know, have lived together at some point. And it was like, okay, they, they huh. could have done something really interesting with that. You know, characters having being forced to live together and, you know, having to know each other and learn to like each other maybe and having to learn to fight together and everything like that. that that's kind of an unusual usual setting and everything. And, you know, you could have done something with that, but they just spent way too many episodes on this really, really bad shonen formula that is mm-hmm. so generic and so worn out and so annoying. And yeah, at the point at the point where the show yeah could have gone like gotten really interesting where they get this like surrogate daughter and everything and okay maybe that was filler i'm not sure but yeah at that point i was like already so so tired (laughs) of this show that i just couldn't finish it that's a shame i guess but you know there will always be a new show and show and probably a lot better ones Mm -hmm. in the future so there you go that's my two cents on uh, (laughs) uh, fucking two twin star exorcists and now I, let's I, never talk about this show again. I, and until the next time. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a lot of those right points were def- a lot of those points definitely hit home with this show as well. Mm. But um, the writer of the show is uh, Yukie Sugawara, and they have worked on stuff like the Idol Master Side M, Overlord, Asterisk War, uh, a regular at Magic High School. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Nana. good track record. <laughs> I mean, Nana's, I like Overlord, but... Yeah. Uh, Nana Nana's Buried Treasure. Recreators. Sword Art Online in the first series. Mm. <laughs> but, I mean, there's, there's there's good word buried in there, which, you know, is... <sighs> and, I mean, we have, to, we have to say, screenplay writer, right? I mean, the main writer is the one for the light of the light novel. Yeah, the original writer, which we... I should mention before we move on, it was a uh, Keiichi Sigasawa who's mm. done some other stuff like some stories called Allison, Allison and Lilia, and Lilia and Trace Kushinada. I guess. <laughs> <Good> question. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. Every time I see the, if I see a character named Trace, I'm just gonna immediately be like Gundam Wing. But 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 yeah, it sounds like uh, you know I was saying. The story is more by the original creator, but I heard a lot of people like those light novels. So this mm. seems like you've stated before. Uh, this this seems to be just you know a bad adaptation, both in terms of direction and in terms of adaptive screenplay writing. Mm-hmm. I wonder what's what's worse, like what's more to blame here. Since I haven't read the original light novels, I can't say. But this echoes the feeling of a lot of people who. Uh, apparently read at least some of the light novels and watched both shows, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the animation was done by Lerk. Lersh? Lerk? Lersh? It was Lerk, right? <laughs> uh, it was a German name. Lersh. Yeah, I don't remember if it was the tree or the bird. <laughs> They're written slightly differently, and I don't know which is what or which was written yeah or how the name of that studio is written so there you go it's it's either a tree or a bird <laughs> there you go but yeah they have worked on stuff like assassination classroom carnival phantasm hakume and mikochi uh monster musume unbreakable machine doll which i think is another show that is a hot point of contention but uh is it uh, I mean, I enjoyed it, but I guess a lot of people were like, oh, it's garbage. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know anything about the original, but I thought it was okay. Uh, but what are they best known for? They're basically the Danganronpa studio. Hey, we brought it full circle. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't understand why the animation quality of the show was as dodgy as it was, though, man. Because, you know, obviously they have proven they can do good work, but, you know. <sighs> Maybe the show got a lower budget than it needed. That could be. It's probably one of those, we'll, we'll know in 10 or 15 years sort of situations. Maybe. Before we, uh, I give my final verdict and we move on, let's go back to a point you brought up earlier. What the hell was with that sheep episode? <laughs> okay. I haven't seen it. I don't know. I've only seen the fucking GIF. It's so... 
What? So I guess there are these sheep as Kino and Hermes are traveling the countryside and Hermes is like, yeah, those sheep will like kill you because they're vicious, evil sheep. Better watch out for them. There's this like big long action sequence and escape scene and then the two of them falling down in a bed of flowers and laughing it off and like, what the fuck, man? Seems just weird, to, like like it wanted to be weird for weirdness' sake. There's so many tone problems with it, like that. Like we can't go out on some, you know. Oh, this is what we learned about the world, sort of thing, because you know mm. they're constantly shoving that down your throat in a, a way that's not meaningful. Mm. And then we end on this note that is like completely out of place and just so goddamn bonkers. It's like. Is this the sheep episode the last episode? Or? Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> what an episode to go out on. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I would struggle very, very hard to recommend this to anyone. Like, I would probably recommend the original show, and I haven't watched it. Yeah, but you're like, anything is probably better than this. I, I thought this show started off, you know, oh, this could be, you know, an interesting sort of... Almost an Iyashike sort of show. Nope. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Doesn't do that. It goes out of its way to not be that because it wants to be this like self-exploration type thing. But it also wants to be an action show. But it also wants to be none of that. At the <sighs> Don't watch this show. It's not great. It really sounds like it can't pull off either of the things it wants to be successfully and you know, just from the concept alone, it's it sounds it sounds such like such a wasted potential. And uh, apparently, that potential was realized in the novel light novels. Otherwise, they wouldn't have you know tried to adapt it for a second time. And mm. you know, apparently, they did a good job in the first one, and then decided, okay, now it's time to adapt some of the old stuff, some of the new stuff with new technique, with new animation and everything. And apparently, none of the stuff. <laughs> is worth checking out if you've seen the old old show and uh, you know if you maybe I don't know if the light novels are available in English even but if they are they are probably also a better um, way to experience the story yeah it looks like you can buy the light novels in English there's at least a um, listing for them on Amazon so there you go I mean buy the light novels or uh, watch the old show yeah, the, the 2017 version of Kino's Journey doesn't really merit watching, to be perfectly honest. I Maybe at some point I'll try and go back and watch the old ones so I can maybe, like, we can have a brief sort of touching on, you know, what it may have done better. Because, you know, obviously I don't have my opinion to go on at the moment. I just have you know, word of mouth from what everyone else has to say, but I wouldn't mind doing a brief revisiting just to say, oh, the original maybe was a little bit better. So as a tentative sort of thing, you can skip over watching the new Kino's journey. So from one girl riding a motorcycle through a surreal patchwork of different societies to two girls riding another vehicle through a land turned into a wasteland by world-ending wars. Yeah, when we meet Chito and Yuri, the two main protagonists of Girls Last Tour, they are riding their trusty cat and crud, which is kind of a mix between a motorcycle and a tank, and a real thing. I looked it up, uh, <laughs> and I didn't know... <laughs> It existed before the show, so there you go, learn something. Uh, but yeah, they they write <laughs> that thing and are apparently entrusted with a mission we don't know yet. They have left behind their home and grandpa, who might not have been their real grandpa, I don't think the show ever clarifies that, uh, to travel the almost empty world to a destination unknown. So this series is based on a manga by Tsukumizu, might be a pen name, probably a pen name, no idea. Uh, but they have only done this one manga so far. Um, which wrapped up in January of this year with six volumes. So I guess there wasn't much time to start something new, to be fair. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, only that so far. Uh, the anime is animated by White Fox, who have worked on stuff like Akamega Kill, The Devil is a Part-Timer, again, that show keeps popping up, <laughs> and Steins Gate. And the show is directed by uh, Takaharu Ozaki, and this seems to be his first gig as a full director. He has worked on a lot of storyboard stuff, though, and is directing the Persona 5 anime coming up. Uh, looking forward to that one. But yeah, as a first outing, this is a really good-looking and well-directed show. Uh, the dead world the girls travel through feels vast and lived in and uh, dead at the same time, which is pretty important considering this is a post-apocalyptic world and story. And there are a lot of great shots highlighting the beautiful environments, um, which also emphasizes how small and alone she and you really are in this world. And the character design of the girls took a bit getting used to for me in the beginning, because it's pretty cartoony. Especially you has kind of this blob of color for a face, which was unusual. Um, but the designs really grew on me after a while, and it works really well with the characterization of the girls who are pretty damn goofy. Something about the uh, character designs, not all throughout Hidamari's sketch, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, some of the you know character artwork used for the... Uh, designs and like the original manga for that so i don't know if that's the inspiration they were trying to drive drive maybe the draw from or not that, that it just sort of struck me as being similar and i was like oh okay you know sure there's also some good use of cg here i can't believe i get to say that twice in one episode about two different shows but here we are uh <laughs> how many times have you said that this season holy shit yeah it's weird it's like and like i said it's the end of the world uh, who are you and what have you done with cc <laughs> it's an imposter yeah i don't know like yeah it's like i said world is coming to an end not only in the show uh but also in real life uh but yeah it's the cg is mostly used for architecture machines and certain shots of the girls riding their cat and crud, but it's used pretty sparsely and feels never intrusive so yeah i i like it when cg is used that way so yeah good stuff some some good decisions were made in that regard in that show the me uh, the melancholic atmosphere of the series is also underlined by the great soundtrack from the hands of kenichiro suehiro uh, who also did the music for re-zero space patrol luluko and uh, the currently airing how to keep a mummy yeah good stuff really really atmospheric stuff some really heartwarming tunes that like <laughs> made emotions well up in my, in my chest and uh, yeah it all works really really well uh with the atmosphere the show is trying to and tone the show is trying to establish so let's talk about slice of life if you have listened to our show for a while you know that i'm not the biggest fan of that genre while john is almost a connoisseur of various slice of life sub genres why are you uh, why are you nosing out on my shtick man <laughs> i'm sorry I didn't mean to. <laughs> you can't have it back soon enough, but... Uh, yeah, I to, we'll, we'll see next season. I had to take my step at it with this one, because, yeah. It's no secret I prefer plot driven shows, mostly, and Slice of Life stuff always needs a certain hook to keep me engaged for, uh, engaged for the entirety of the show. Um, hasn't worked for the two Slice of Life shows, I, or three Slice of Life shows, I think, that I started this season. I dropped off all of them. <laughs> so there you go. It's a tough thing to uh, to make happen for me. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, it, like I said, it needs a hook. Like, uh, for example, the Magic Drench setting of Flying Witch. I really enjoyed that for some reason, because I like this. I like the mix of reality with magic, you know, that is just at the at the corner of your uh, of your field of view that you can barely grasp you can't quite see it and then it's there stephen king does that really well in his in his novels and i enjoy that too just combining uh real life with this you know with some form of surreal or magical aspect and i think flying witch did that really well and that kept me engaged another hook is for example, was, for example, the almost painfully relatable protagonist of Watamoto, a show I also quote-unquote enjoyed, I guess? <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird to kind of say, I enjoyed Watamote when it's like, when the subject matter is what it is. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, you know, those are the things then ca that can pull me in, that can keep me engaged from beginning to end if they're well executed. 
And Girls Last Tour is not an exception from this rule, but since I watched it all the way through, you can already guess where this is going. I would not have been interested in the show if it was just two girls riding their weird tank cycle doing cute things. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of that in the show. Uh, but what pulled me immediately into this was the world these girls inhabit. Like, I mentioned before the world in the show feels so much bigger than our protagonists. And even though it's pretty clear how it came to be this way, you know, there's war machinery lying around everywhere. You know, there's destroyed buildings. There are, like, basically empty, uh, vacant cities. And, you know, okay, we know what happens even before things are clarified. It's like, okay, there were a couple of giant wars, probably some bomb thrones. All the humans are... Almost all of the humans are dead, probably. And this is probably a world at the brink of extinction. So no animals are seen and everything. It's just empty. It's dead. And uh, only some machines are alive and stuff like that. So yeah. So it's pretty clear how this, what this world is and how it came to be. But I still wanted to know more about it and like unearth its deeper mysteries. Thankfully, the show does a very good job of introducing us to this world through the eyes of the main protagonist, through the girl's eyes. Um, she and you are not really that world savvy. I mean, they know their way around. She is very like, is, is like a techie. She knows how to repair the cat and crud most of the time. And uh, she can read and everything. And, and you knows how to handle a gun. But since they seem to have spent most of their life with their grandpa, they don't really know a lot of stuff outside of their home and outside of their world. So they stumble a lot of stuff that is unknown to them. Uh, a lot of stuff they encounter, they, just like us, encounter for the first time. Certain machinery, certain ruins, certain things. Some, a lot of things that we know the meaning of that they don't, but through them, you know encountering that and and you know talking about it and and exploring it we also learn about what happened to that p specific part of the world and that was really well pulled off in my opinion and makes you really like feel or, or makes you really invested and uh makes it really easy to uh like get, get immersed into this universe and this world that the girls live in we, yeah, we get to learn with them about the history of the world, and it's pretty much never done with the heavy use of uh, exposition dumps, which I really appreciate it, because that's always like, tell instead of show is like one of the worst offenders mm. in, in, you know, in, in, in storytelling in movies. So I'm really glad that this, this rarely happened. Yeah, we have some characters who spout some exposition here and there, but it's skipped to a really, like, to a bare minimum, in my opinion. And yeah, the characters talk a lot and, you know, have some conversations, but it's, you know, it's so rarely about, oh, okay, this happened, this happened, and then this happened. That's so, yeah, it's just, you know, the characters talking about uh, uh, about what they experience on a daily basis. And, oh, have you seen this? What do you think about that? I don't know what that is and stuff like that. And it's just, <laughs> it's just interesting and uh, engaging. And we learned that this must be much farther in the future than current day. Because, for example, um, there's a new lang a new language seems to have been dev developed, like there are different signs, you know, from from usual kanji and everything. Uh, I mean, she can read, uh, but when she comes across English or normal Japanese, she can't decipher it. There is like this new, I don't know, abbreviated form or you know subverted form of of the japanese language that they can that she can read but the classic stuff when they stumble across some really old books uh she can't she can't decipher it she doesn't know, doesn't know what is it uh, what what's in it but since she's a bookworm and she really you know thinks that books are important because they tell history and she writes a diary and everything she just keeps it and it's like hey this this needs to be uh this needs to survive and survive and this needs to be kept safe so, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, another thing that, you know, speaks, that, that tells you how, how old this world is at this point. So the girls don't know what phrases like cheese or cheers mean. Like, you know, <laughs> the things you say. They, you know, the, at some point they get a camera and they, they make a photo and they say cheese. I don't know which of them says it first. And then they want to like, What's that, what does that even mean? Why, why do you say that? <laughs> 
yeah, it's it's, uh, but it's funny. And the same with the cheers thing and everything. There's a really funny episode where they stumble, and, and heartwarming episode where they stumble across some some alcohol. <laughs> And, yeah, of course, of course, you know where this is going. But it's, yeah, it's not, it's not like uh, silly or or like goofy for the sake of being goofy. There's always some, I don't know, some. It always feels like there's some substance to it, and I don't know. It always feels like it belongs to the story of those girls, and they never seem like they act out of character when uh, when you know they encounter uh, old stuff that they've never come across. So yeah, every, everything feels like it's set in a distant future. You know, a lot of old machinery, a lot of you know, a lot of old buildings. But because a lot of the stuff seems so familiar, that future is still terrifyingly close within grasp. Like it feels like okay, if we don't pay attention, if we go on the path that you know some people in this world are going this future is closer than we think and that is terrifying and the world plays with that a lot too uh, the the show plays a lot with that too it builds uh, there are a lot of scenes where it builds like a threatening atmosphere you know that isn't always paid off it's like oh no here comes danger and everything it, you know it just disappears and vanishes into thin air but it always it never feels like a cheap trick or anything because there is always this underlying sense of danger because this is a dying world. This is this is scary. This is what can happen if you know uh, things develop in a certain way in our world. And yeah, the the tone and the atmosphere in this show is really potent, and I really enjoyed it. Um, there's also a deeper mystery surrounding the many these many weird looking statues spread everywhere throughout the world. Uh, that the girls come across a lot, which actually gets wrapped up by the end and left me pretty satisfied. So I was really grateful for that. So yeah, there's a bit of plot in here. Oh, <laughs> go figure. I mean, most of the stuff is, you know, just the girls encountering things and talking about them and checking them out and trying to find out how they work. And, you know, that's happening in each episode. And it's pretty, like I said, episodic. But, you know, there is an underlying threat there. And that also, like like I said, builds up to a, a well-done conclusion and fits perfectly with the tone of the show. So it's like, it's basically like the antique Kino's journey, I guess, in that regard. I was about to say, everything you're talking about is like the opposite of the show we just talked about. Yeah. That sounds it's a, good. Yeah, it's, it's a nice counterpoint. <laughs> I want you to end it on something good. And uh, yeah, I didn't know if I would because uh, I have to admit, I just finished up that show today uh i watched like the first episode and i was had so much other stuff to do and i was like oh god i, I gotta girls last tour and the more i like postponed this <laughs> i was like oh man i like the first episode of the show but oh there's so much other stuff to watch and i gotta watch it for the show <laughs> and i was like holy shit and then i binged it because i really got sucked into it and i was so happy that i you know left the show with such good feelings and so um you know satisfied I sort of hear this show mentioned in the same breath as uh, Made in Abyss and Land of the Lustrous as well. So it's good to hear that, you know, people do think highly of this enough to put it, you know, alongside the, these other hard hitters from this past season. It's a lot lot less plot driven than those other shows. Although, uh, like I mentioned in my Land of the Lustrous review, that is also kind of light on plot, but you get the feeling that they're trying to go somewhere. But but you know, I would say Le Girls Last Two is the most slice of lifey of those shows, mm -hmm. which is not to say it's a bad thing. It's like you know that's what it is, and Made in the Abyss is definitely the most plot driven of those shows, and maybe that's why I enjoyed it the most. But I also enjoyed those other two shows. So there you go. So yeah, um, let's talk about let's talk more about our main protagonists, which are pretty great. Um, Chito is a bit of an introverted pessimist. She's afraid of heights, not super brave, but pretty smart. Uh, you is kind of the exact opposite. She's an airhead, uh, often dumb, <laughs> a bit, <laughs> a bit stupid, and a troublemaker, and always hungry. But she is optimistic and carefree, sometimes to a dangerous extent. Um, but yeah, that's a good counterpoint to Chi. And... It's very important that the main characters are so likable and sympathetic because we spent almost the entire series 
only with them. Girls Last Two has a very small cast. Very small. <laughs> like, it's mostly just those two. And you spend 12 episodes with them. So it's very important that you like these characters. <laughs> and I did. So, yeah. You know, this is a dead world. And we encounter very few other people in this story. Two, to be exact. Which are great characters by themselves. But don't stick around for more than one episode. So I'm glad the time we spent only with Cheeto and Yuri never felt annoying or wasted. Now, the other thing I liked about the show, besides the world and the characters, is the tone of the story. And the series, by way of the experiences of the two girls, ask a lot of questions about humanity, what it means to be alive, where we are going, what matters most in life, and especially how to act in the face of, like, pretty much ultimate hopelessness. Um, by all means, the girls traverse a dying world. There is basically nowhere to go but forward. Uh, there seems to be nothing left for them at home. Uh, you know, there are some flashbacks. You can't really s tell what happened to their grandpa, but you can. You know, because there's gunfire in the background. And, uh, you know, you, you see where this is going and why they had to flee. Uh, you know, their, their grandpa basically wanted to give them, you know, a, a chance to, to live, at least for a bit longer. But yeah, there doesn't seem any goal or salvation at the end of their road. The way T and you react, though, often, you know, very differently to these, you know, their daily adversities and the stuff they discover on the way is a big draw of the show. And there's this great scene where the girls argue about whether life would be better if you were given clear directions because they're in a labyrinth and, you know, they come across some arrows that point the way and um, they argue, would it be better to have that in life so that you knew where to go um, and had a clear goal in mind? And she thinks it would make life better and easier while you thinks it would be boring and exploring life by yourself is more worthwhile uh, and exciting. She is, like I mentioned before, a realist or pessimist most of the time, but even she dares to hope, which is important, and you even makes like this upbeat song that entirely consists of the word hopelessness, or <laughs> Zetsubo, uh, basically taking away the negative meaning of the word and turning it into something positive, like she, <laughs> she just uses, ah, uh, okay, it's, it's hopeless, but that doesn't mean that we just give up on living. We just, you know, go forward. Being positive and facing the adversities the world throws at you one step at a time seems to be one of the main messages of the show. That counts for the few other characters in the series as well. They try to give meaning to their lives uh, by giving themselves a grand task to achieve. But even when they lose everything, there's always the sense of hope or accomplishment or freedom uh, and satisfaction for trying to escape the sorrow of this barren world. And that was just, ah, I don't know, that that felt substantial. And most of that stuff works really well, in my opinion. So yeah, um, this is a great little show with two very sympathetic protagonists, uh, a beautifully, beautifully crafted world. And while it doesn't have much plot to speak of, there is enough narrative meat in there to get even more plot-focused people like me hooked. I highly recommend it. Maybe don't binge it, but watch it one episode at a time. Mm. The story is told in chapters, and there are multiple chapters in most episodes that lead into each other. The show left me pretty happy and satisfied by the end, like I said. I don't know if there will be a second season, because I don't know if there's any manga material left. But even if there isn't, the ending totally fits with the tone of the rest of the show and doesn't really need any more episodes, in my opinion. Hell, it probably stands better on its own. But yeah, Girls Last Tour, highly recommended. Make no mistake, this is a sad story about the end of the world and the final days of humanity. But it's also an uplifting story about friendship that leaves you with just enough of a glimmer of hope. And that is a wrap on the 47th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Drain Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jack Kaufman. Please go to vrt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze. We tweet regular updates and fun anime-related stuff there. 
leave us comments and questions on Facebook and our YouTube channel, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next show. Macht's gut. See you next time, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. A ray of sunshine, but does this one burn as brightly? Also, John and I fight each other in a holy grail war. Brrr.